Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts, may they be acceptable and may they be pleasing in thy sight, O Lord, you who are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So on this Confirmation Sunday, we may have that question that's before us of what is Confirmation all about. We, we all have confirmed vows this morning at the communion table, at the confirmation opportunity. We've all received this morning a sign of confirming our vows, baptism vows, membership vows, covenants, promises, confirmation, baptism. Those are, those are special moments for us. There was a country church, country church that uh, just received a new pastor, and, and they welcomed this pastor with, with loving arms, and they, they said to her as she was coming in, uh, everything's great here, we just have one little caveat that we need to let you know about, is that we have some unwelcome members that show up every Sunday. They're here all the time, actually. You'll see remnants of them, they, they're the bats. Loads of them. Bats that live in the open rafters of our sanctuary. We've tried everything to get rid of these bats. We've set up screens at the openings. We've called exterminators. We have done everything in our power to get rid of these bats over the years. And nothing that we've done has ever been able to get rid of them. So you might as well just welcome them with loving arms as members of this, your new church. So... She said to them, very wisely, thank you, I will take that under advisement. And that was on a, on a Monday. By the next Sunday, they all came in, they sat down, and they looked to see their fellow members up in the rafters, and they were all gone. For the first time in the history of the church, the bats were gone, not a single one of them was in the rafters. And slack-jawed, they looked at their new pastor, and they were beaming from ear to ear, and they said, What? What did you do to get rid of these bats? And she looked at them and calmly said, Yesterday, Saturday morning, I went in with some water, and I baptized, and I confirmed them, and we will never see them again. <laughs> Sometimes we have a misunderstanding about confirmation, don't we? we sometimes we have a, a, a misunderstanding about baptism as if it is a rite of passage rather than an outward sign of an inward grace. Sometimes we get our cues mixed up as to what it's all about. But you know what? I'm so encouraged this morning. I'm so encouraged because of the fact that the four young men that were up here confirming their vows, it was the weirdest thing to say to them, God bless you and welcome. How do you say welcome to four young men that have been active participants within the life of the church? That give me every sign and seal that they are not going to be like those bats in that old country church. And our members that have been actively involved in you giving out a recommitment of your membership vows and your vows to love and support them in their living out of their vows. That's a good sign, isn't it? It's a good sign as a church that we're at a spot where all those who've been confirmed and have been welcomed into the life of the church already get it. They figured out that what faith is about is relationships. Faith is about relationships. So I went to my wife, Megan, yesterday, and I said to her, we've got this whole relationship thing figured out, you and I. <laughs> we've studied one another. I've studied it. I've learned about who you are. I really love what you have to offer me. So I'm, I'm ready to go out on my own, knowing that you love me, 
and live a life on my own. Oh, don't worry, I'll call on you when I, when I need something. Oh, and I know that you'll be there when I need you. But otherwise, I think I got this. <laughs> now, isn't that the silliest thing that you've ever heard about how to handle a relationship? Do marriages thrive on this kind of understanding of the relationship? No, it's silliness, but isn't it amazing how many times we've heard of people approaching their relationship with God in this sort of way? Right? Think about it. I've studied you. I think I understand how this whole thing works. I really love what you have to offer me, and we're good until I need something, and then I know you're going to be there for me. Awkward, isn't it? When we put it in that kind of light. Thanks for getting me going in the right direction. I'll take it from here. That does not go well. So how do we think that this is the way that we ought to approach our relationship with God? There once was a grandfather who sat his grandson down and he said, if there's anything that I can give you of importance, it's this. Inside you lives two wolves. Inside you lives two wolves. One that is seeking out to satisfy its own stomach. One wolf that is out there to seek and to destroy and to consume everything that it possibly can do on its own. But then there's another wolf that lives inside of you. And that wolf seeks to live within the pack. Seeks to live a life of faithfulness, a life of love and hope and joy. And to give more than it receives. Inside you, grandson, lives these two wolves. And they fight and they rage within you for one seeking to live over the other. And the grandson, with wide eyes, says to his grandfather, Grandfather, which one of these wolves will win? And the grandfather says, Whichever one you feed. Whichever wolf you feed is the one who will win. Relationships are what make relationships real. Relationships are what makes religion real. That's what I'm becoming more and more convinced about, is that I'm having a tougher and tougher time with the word faith. Especially when you hear over and over and over again, especially this last terrorist attack that happened in Belgium, that somebody cries out and says, we don't need your prayers. Prayers is what got us in this problem in the first place. Religion is what got us here in the first place. So don't pray for Belgium. And it breaks my heart. It breaks my heart because of the fact that at some point in time, we've gotten derailed into thinking that religion is about faith, about a, a set of things that we make mental assents to. That faith is about creeds, or faith is about belief in a certain set of propositions. And what this world needs is a bunch of Christians out there that believes in faithfulness more than faith. Faith says, I believe. Faithfulness says, I love. If we had a bunch more of us convinced about who they ought to love rather than a bunch of people convinced about what they believe, I bet we'd be closer to what Jesus asked his disciples to do and to be long ago. It's about relationships more than it is about creeds. It's our faithfulness that feeds into our faith, not a set of beliefs that then feeds into what we ought to do. The prophet says, he's shown you, O oh mortal, what is good and what the Lord desires of thee, to love justice, to seek mercy, and to walk humbly with God. It's about relationships. If I could give you any teaching this morning, newly confirmed people, it's about relationships. 
Being a disciple of Jesus Christ means relationships. It's because of that. Relationships never come to an end. Relationships never reach completion. How many of you have been married for more than 50 years? God bless you. You found that, that marriage never reaches completion. And the same with discipleship. It's about faithfulness. It's a relationship that never ends. It's not a sprint. It's not a marathon. It's a race with no finish line. Are you out for that? Are you okay with that? Are you okay with the idea that there is no finish line? I'm convinced that not even death is the finish line. Because I really don't want to be a part of an afterlife where the relationship with God ceases to grow. Right? Where the relationship with, with those on the other side of the life to come reaches some sort of completion. That seems silly. That we work all this on this side of the veil to, to work on relationships and then we're all done on the other side. That seems silly. Relationships never reach completion. We continue to learn and develop and to change. There's a lot of wait for it. Wait for it. That's fine. It should be fine. Because there's no rush. If God prepared this world over the course of billions of years to get it just right for us to be able to be here. That certainly tells us that God's in no rush. If God was in a rush, God wouldn't command us to take one day off every single week. God's in no rush, so why should we be? This week, we had a uh, come-to-Jesus moment at our home. We were getting ready to go someplace, and Fiona was lagging behind a little bit, as toddlers often do. And so we started in with a, come on, come on, Fiona, it's time to go. Come on, come on, Fiona, it's time to go. And Fiona says to us, I'm coming, relax. <laughs> I would like to say that she learned that word from television, but I don't think she did. It's amazing what our children pick up from us. And to hear a two-year-old tell you to relax. Kind of slows things down, puts things in perspective. Relax. Focus on relationships. Invest in faithfulness. Invest in faithfulness. Stay together, living together, loving together. Even when the going gets rough. And as we do this as a community of faith, as we continue to live out our vows, prayers, presence, gifts, service, if we live that out in faithfulness, the faith comes along with it. And in so doing, we, we model what it means to be disciples of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.